Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Satiro Mastix or The Untrussing of the Humorous Poet by Thomas Decker and possibly a little bit of uh, Marston in there as well, though uh, precise divisions of labour uh, does depend on individual people's interpretations. Um, this is very much a response to a play we looked at a couple of weeks ago, uh, The Poetaster, um, and uh, yeah, where uh, Ben Johnson might have been a little bit rude uh, about Decker and Marston. Um, and so this is, uh, this is something of a response where we fully expect that in some coded ways that will be very subtle, uh, that, uh, that uh, Decker might be quite rude about Ben Johnson in response, as it hath been presented publicly by the Right Honourable the Lord Chamberlain, his servants, and privately by the children of Paul's. So, uh, yes, different different venues, different people uh, doing performing things. So, uh, yeah, we're going to find out how this, uh, this one lands as a response, but also as a play in its own right that we might want to understand as just a piece of entertainment. Let's see if that's possible. Uh, we're reading today, Horace is... Alexandra, currently surrounded Surrounded by an orchestra of construction noises. Nice. Reading Sir Quintilian and Asidius is... Hello, I'm Lynn, and uh, this is my faithful assistant, Scooter. And, and uh, yeah, I'm here in the northwestern United States, where it's early in the morning. Hmm. Reading First Gentlewoman and Sir Vaughan is... I'm based in Suffolk with no Welsh connection. Reading Second Gentlewoman uh, Miniver uh, Crispinus and King is. My name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in the southeast of England. Uh, reading uh, Sir Adam Terrell and Tucker is. Bryony Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. And reading Flash Demetrius Blunt and Celestine is... Lois Potter, here in London, where I have a superb view of traffic hell. <laughs> yes, we all have our background noise that we hope yeah. that the Zoom's filters will be able to remove, and some of us may be more successful than others. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, we go into the opening of the show, uh, a sort of scene one's induction crossover area um now it, there's a little note uh, in instead of the trumpet sounding thrice so the usual sort of trumpet sounding before the play begin it shall not be amiss for him that will read first to behold this short comedy of errors mm -hmm. and where the greatest enter to give them instead of a hiss mm -hmm. a gentle correction so let's uh, go into this introductory uh, a, a, a moment of uh, short comedy of errors um Scene one, enter two gentlewomen, strewing of flowers. Come, bedfellow, come. Strew pace, strew, strew. In good troth, tis pity that these flowers must be trodden under feet as they are likely to be or not. Pity. Alack, pretty heart, <laughs> thou art sorry to see any good thing fall to the ground. Pity. No more pity than to see an innocent maidenhead delivered up to the ruffling of her new wedded husband. Beauty is made for use, and he that will not use a sweet soul well, when she is under his fingers, I pray, Venus, he may never kiss a fair and delicate, soft, red, plump lip. Amen, and that's torment enough. Pity? Come, fool, fling them about lustily. Flowers never die a sweeter death than when they are smothered to death in a lover's bosom, or else pave the highways over which these pretty, simpering, setting things called brides must trip. I pray thee tell me, why do they use at weddings to furnish all places thus, with sweet herbs and flowers? One reason is, because tis, oh, a most sweet thing to lie with a man. I think tis an oh more, 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 more sweet to lie with a woman. I warrant all men are of thy mind. Another reason is because they stick like the scutcheons of Madame Chastity on the sable ground, weeping in their stalks and winking with their yellow sunk eyes, as loath to behold the lamentable fall of a maidenhead. What scentless thing in all the house that is not now as melancholy as a new set up schoolmaster. Troth, I am. Troth, 
I think thou mournest, because that's thus missed thy turn. I do by the quiver of Cupid. You see the torches melt themselves away in tears, the instruments wear their heart strings out for sorrow, and the silver ewers weep most pitiful rose water. Five or six pair of the white innocent wedding gloves did in my sight choose rather to be torn in pieces than to be drawn on. And look, this rosemary, a fatal herb, this dead man's nosegay has crept in amongst these flowers to deck the invisible course of the bride's maidenhead. When, oh, how much do we poor wenches suffer? About 11 or 12 or one o'clock at midnight at furthest, it descends to purgatory to give notice that Calistine, hey ho, will never come to lead apes in hell. I see by thy sighing, thou wilt not. If I had as many maidenheads as I have hairs on my head, I'd venture them all rather than to come into so hot a place. Prithee, strew thou, for my little arms are weary. I'm sure thy little tongue is not. <laughs> no, Faith, that's like a woman bitten with fleas. It never lies still. Fire upon it. What a miserable thing tis to be a noble bride. There's such delays in rising, in fitting gowns, in tiring, in pinning rebatos, in poking, in dinner, in supper, in revels, and last of all, in cursing the poor nodding fiddlers for keeping Mistress Bride so long up from sweeter revels that, oh, I could never endure to put it up without much bickering. Come, thou nod, wench. Hark, hark, music. Nay then, the bride's up. Is she up? Nay, then I see she has been down. Lord, have mercy on us. We women fall and fall still, and when we have husbands, we play upon them like virginal jacks. They must rise and fall to our humours, or else they'll never get any good strains of music out of us. But come now, have at it for our maidenhead. And so, as they strew, enter Sir Quintilian Shorthose with Peter, Flash, and two or three serving men with lights. Um, knaves, knights begin to be like them myself, an old man. Day plays the thief and steals upon us. Oh, well done, wenches, well done, well done. You have covered all the stony way to church with flowers. Tis well, tis well. There's an emblem, too, to be made out of these flowers and stones, but you are honest, wenches. In, in, in. When we come to your years, we shall learn what honesty is. Come, pew fellow. Exuant gentlewomen. Is the music come yet? So much to do is come. Come, um, sir. Have the merry knaves pulled their fiddle cases, fiddle cases over their instruments' ears? As soon as ere they entered our gates, the noise went. Before they came near the great hall, the, the faint-hearted villiacos sounded at least thrice. <laughs> Thou shouldst have revived them with a cup of burnt wine and sugar, Sarah. You horse keeper, go. Bid them curry their strings. Is my daughter up yet? And exit, presumably a servant. Uh, up, sir? <laughs> she was seen up an hour ago. She's an early stirrer. Ah, Sira. Uh, she'll be a light stirrer soon at night, sir. Go to, Peter Flash. You have a sudden flash of brain. Your wit's husky. And no marvel, for it is like one of your comedian's beards. Still the stubble. About your business, and look you be nimble to fly from the wine, or the nimble wine shall catch you by the nose. Huh. If your wine play with my nose, sir, I'll knock his coxcomb. <laughs> Do, Peter, and wear it for thy labour. Is my son-in-law, Sir Walter Terrell, ready yet? Ready, sir. Yes, all, uh, so, uh, <laughs> everyone says all, that's an all cue, just, just, to, ready, just to mention who all are. Uh, <laughs> just remind everyone, all together now. Ready, sir. Ready, ready sir. sir. Thank you. Exit another servant. One of you attend him. Stay, Flash. Where's the note of the guests you have invited? Uh, here, sir, I'll pull all of your guests out of my bosom. Uh, the men that will come, I have crossed. But all the gentlewomen have at the tail of the last letter a prick, because you may read them. Uh, the sooner, the, yeah, the better. Ah. My spectacles, light, 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 knaves. Sir Adam Pickshaft, thou hast crossed him. He'll come. 
Uh, I had much ado, sir, to draw Sir Adam Prickshaft home because I told him it was early, but he'll come. Just as crop. Well, what will he come? Uh, he took physic yesterday, sir. Oh, then crop cannot come. Oh, your lord, sir, yes. Uh, Twas but to make more room in his crop for your good cheer. Crop will come. <laughs> Widow Miniver? Uh, she's pricked, you see, and will come. Sir Vaughan Ap Reese. Oh, he's crossed twice. So, so, so. Then all the ladies that fall downwards here will come, I see, and all these gentlemen that stand right before them. All will come. Well, uh, here, write them out again and put the men from the women. And Peter, when we are at church, bring wine and cakes. Be light and nibble, good flash, for your burden will be but light. Enter Sir Adam, a light before him. Sir Adam Prickshaft, a good morrow, good morrow. Go in, in, in to the bridegroom, taste a cup of burnt wine this morning. Twill make you fly the better all the day after. You are an early stirrer, Sir Quintilian Shorthose. <laughs> I am so. It behooves me at my daughter's wedding. In, in, in. Fellow, put out the torch and put thyself into my buttery. The torch burns ill in thy hand. The wine will burn better in thy belly. In, in. Uh, where there, room for Sir Adam Prickshaft, your worship. Exit Sir Adam, enter Sir Vaughan and Mistress Miniver. Sir Vaughan and Widow Miniver, welcome, welcome a thousand times. My lips, Mistress Widow, shall bid you good mor bid you God morrow in, in, one to the bridegroom, the other to the bride. Why then, Sir Quintilian Shortos, I will step into Mistress Bride and Widow Minerva should go to Master Bridegroom. No pardon, for by my truly Savorn, <coughs> I'll have no dealings with any Master Bridegroom. In, Widow, in, in, honest knight, in. I will usher you, Mistress Widow. Life there for Sir Vaughan, your good worship. Drink that shilling, Master Peter Flash, in your guts and belly. I'll not drink it down, sir, but I'll turn it into that which shall run down. Oh, merrily. Exit Sir Vaughan. Enter Blunt, Crispinus, Demetrius, and others with ladies' lights before them. God morrow to these beauties and gentlemen that have ushered this troop of ladies to my daughter's wedding. Welcome, welcome all. Music? Nay, then the bridegroom's crumbing. Where are these knaves here? Uh, all here, sir. Enter Tyrrell, Sir Adam, Sir Vaughan, Celestine, Miniver, and other ladies and attendants with lights. Good morrow, ladies and fair troops of gallants that have deposed the drowsy king of sleep to crown our train with your rich presences. I salute you all. Ah, uh, one share thanks from thanks in general. Good morrow, Master Bridegroom, Mistress Bride. Good morning, Master Bridegroom. Gallants, I shall entreat you to prepare for masks and revels to defeat the night. Our sovereign will in person grace our marriage. What? Will the king be here? Father, he will. Where be these knaves? More rosemary and gloves, gloves, gloves. Choose, gentlemen. Ladies, put on the soft skins upon the skin of softer hands. So, so, come, Mistress Bride. Take you your place in the old men first, and then the bachelors, maids with the bride, widows and wives together, the priests, the priests at church. Tis time that we march thither. Dear Blunt, at our return from church, take pains to step to Horace for our nuptial songs. Now, father, when you please. Agreed. Set on. Come, good Sir Vaughan. Uh, must we lead the way? Peter, you go too fast for Mistress Bride, so gingerly, gingerly. Amuse why Sir Adam Pritchard sticks so short behind. He follows close, not too fast, hold up, knaves. Thus we lead youth to church, they us to graves. And they exit. So we've got, um, in a sense, uh, a relatively straightforward uh, setup in the scene itself that we, once it gets going, uh, of there's been a marriage and some dialogue happens and uh, there's there's uh, there's music and uh, uh, but we, we we open with this rather lengthy exchange of two gentlewomen uh, strewing flowers 
um, which uh, it was slightly harder to disentangle. Um, I'm sure they were being terribly witty and interesting or something, but it I I struggled to engage with a, a lot of that. Um, and though I like the idea of opening a show with strewing lots of of of, of flowers for the the, the scent and the, the the atmosphere. I think it's quite a nice mm -hmm. way of drawing the audience into and then the music plays and then everybody bursts on and oh it's this happening this happening ha 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 um and you sort of get a sense of uh, of 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 the scene even if you're not necessarily wholly grabbing who anyone is you're definitely grabbing a sense of an occasion so there, there, there's a lot going on here um uh in in this uh, scene uh lynn then alan i think first yeah i think probably the gentlewomen are making a lot of sex jokes Mm. Oh yeah, uh, uh, but uh, but but you know, time has made those a little opaque to us. Uh, so you know, cut that down. But still, I think we're just sort of setting a mood here. It's and it's so it's so fun. You know, the father of the bride kind of bustling around. It's like is she up or the musicians? You know, I just think that's really it could be really cute and charming. I hope that that's how the, it's supposed to be because it's it's really it's really kind of delightful that that you know we're spreading flowers and we're getting ready for a wedding and uh and the and the and the father of the bride seems to be so excited about it and uh and i i, I don't it's 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 so fun mm. uh, Alan? <laughs> yeah i mean i i think this is a legacy of the stage performance and it was basically the turn off your mobiles um mm. bit between the soundings mm. um nobody was probably paying too much attention. And I suspect, certainly when it was done by the boys company, that Lynn is correct, that there would have been an awful lot of um, double entendre in there that have been lost to time with the changes in language. Mm. Um, and obviously the exit line at the end of the fir that first scene where we've just broken is the whole parade on the way to church. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's it's. I mean, it's interesting because the the difference in effect. Uh, you know, if you're doing it, at Children's of Paul's, uh, a relatively small space, strewing the space with flowers is going to have a real impact. Whereas if you do it at, at, at uh, it's um, yeah, at the, at the globe, it's going to be big and open, and it's not going to have that kind of impact uh, or mm. in the same way, depending on how many how much undergrowth that you you true about i mean it's 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 going to be you know um so it's it's quite interesting the difference in what those effects might be and whether uh that is designed for one space as opposed to another um it's the kind of thing you go well it's, it won't work in this venue but it will work somewhere else it, how how detachable is that opening sequence uh from the uh from the whole uh beyond just oh well done thank you for storing the flowers goodbye um you know how much of that is 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 is, is essential um uh, it feels it feels more indoory that opening sequence than outdoory, but I could be wrong. Uh, other thoughts, Alexandra. Just on the subject of the two gentlewomen throwing flowers, um, I I can't find it now, but very early on, one of them complains about the waste and the cost, um, and I think that and that is a sort of an additional element of fun, you know, especially if you're doing this with real flowers every every performance. Um, uh, I also wanted to point out uh, the uh, the. First, gentle. I, this is just modern interpretation placed over uh, what would have been understood in the period. But the first gentlewoman starts with, come bedfellow, come, and then responds to a question about lying with men with, I think it's more sweet to lie with a woman. I'm just going to leave that there. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I... I I was writing in the comments while this bit was happening, actually at the beginning of the Serquintillion section, that um, I didn't like it. I didn't find this bit fun. Um, because if you start by um, putting what is it? It's not mockery, but it's... it's Because um, it isn't body language per se. It's sort of hint, hint, nudge, nudge um, towards things that, that people should consider both... Uh, embarrassing or shameful and kind of traditional to do with, with marriage. They're all talking about virginity and the loss of virginity and all that. And you put that into 
you put that kind of dialogue as an author into the mind of, of uh, characters who would have uh, been subjected to that treatment, that, that sort of behavior, it's kind of um, unfair, right? If you, when you've got the father kind of doing hint, hint, nudge, nudge uh, jokes, that feels a lot more kind of um, suitable in, in context. Because presumably everybody would be all about the, the, the uh, bride and bridegroom, you know, making them uh, feel awkward. Um, but yeah, the, the something about it to begin with rang to me very sort of um, manipulative. Uh, other thoughts or responses? N no, 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 nobody's got anything there. Uh, okay, uh, well, um, we've mentioned that, uh, I say this is, this is in part a response to um, another play, uh, thus far not noticing an awful lot of responses to that previous play at all. Um, uh, apart from the reiteration of a couple of character names, we might now, however, get something that is uh, a bit more on point. We shall see as uh, we go to scene two and we have the entrance of Horace. Horace sitting in a study behind a curtain, a candle by him burning, books lying confusedly and speaking to himself. Though muted at present, and you have props, and you therefore had, you have to had put a the great props setup. Down oh well, and, uh... you get the idea, audience. To thee, whose forehead swells with roses, whose most haunted bower gives life and scent to every flower, whose most adored name encloses things abstruse, deep, and divine, whose yellow tresses shine bright as eo and fire. Oh, me, thy priest inspire for i to thee and thine immortal name in 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 golden tunes for i to thee and thine immortal name in sacred raptures flowing flowing swimming swimming in sacred raptures swimming immortal name game tame lame 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 um, plucks hath shame proclaim in sacred raptures flowing will proclaim not oh me thy priest inspire for i to thee and thine immortal name in flowing numbers filled with sprite and flame good good in flowing numbers filled with sprite and flame enter asinia spubo <laughs> Horace, Horace, my sweet Ningle, is always in labor when I come. Then thy muses be his midwives, I pray Jupiter. Ningle. In flowing numbers filled with sprite and flame to thee. To me. I pledge thee, sweet Ningle, by Bacchus quaffing bowl. I thought thou hadst drunk to me. Must have been in the divine liquor of Parnassus, then, in which I know you would scarce have pledged me. But come, rogue, sit, sit, sit. <laughs> Overhead, muse, in faith, I have a sackful muse for thee. Thou shalt plague some of them if God send us life and health together. It is no matter. Empty thy sack anon. But come here first, honest ro rogue. Come. <laughs> it's good, it's good. Pure helicon, huh? Damn me, if it be not the best that ever came from me, if I have any judgment. Look, sir, tis an epithalamium for Sir Walter Terrell's wedding. My brains have given a salt to it, but this morning. Then I hope to see them fly out like gunpowder ere night. They could rogue mark, for they are the best lines that ever I drew. Here's the best leaf in England, but on, on, I'll but tune this pipe. Mark, to thee whose forehead dwells it with roses, swells with roses, to thee whose forehead swells with roses. Oh, sweet, but there will be no exceptions taken because forehead and swelling come together. Push away, it's proper. Besides, tis an elegancy to say the forehead swells. <laughs> Nay, and it be proper, let it stand for God's love. Hmm. Whose most haunted bower gives life and scent to every flower, whose most adored name encloses things abstruse, deep, 
and divine, whose yellow tresses shine bright as Ioan fire. Oh, pure rich, there's heat in this. On, on. Uh, bright as Ioan fire, oh, me thy priest inspire. For I to thee and thine immortal name Mark this, in flowing numbers, filled with sprite and flame. I marry there's sprite and flame in this. <coughs> Box of this tobacco. <laughs> Would this case were my last if I did not mark, nay, all's one. I have always a consort of pipes about me. Mine eagle is all fire and water. I marked by this candle, which is none of God's angels. I remember you started back. And sp sprite and flame. What, uh, uh, for I to thee and thine immortal name, in flowing numbers filled with sprite and flame, to thee, love's mightiest king, Hymen, oh Hymen, does our chaste muse sing. Oh, there's music in this. Mark now, dear Asinius. Asinius. Let these virgins quickly see thee leading out the bride, though their blushing cheeks they hide, yet with kisses will they fee thee to untie their virgin zoni. They grieve to lie alone. <laughs> so do I, by Venus. Yet with kisses will they fee thee. My muse has marched, dear rogue, no farther yet. But uh, how is't? How is't? Nay, pretty good, Asana, deal plainly. Do, do not flatter me. How, come, how? If I have any judgment. <laughs> Nay, look you, sir, and follow a troop of other rich and laboured conceits, oh, the end shall be admirable. But how is't, sweet Bubo? How? How? If I have any judgment, tis the best stuff ever dropped from thee. You have seen my acrostics. I'll put up my pipes and then I'll see anything. That's the copy of mine odes, too. Has not, Google. Oh, your odes. Oh, that which you spake by word of mouth at the ordinary when mm -hmm. Musco the gull cried mew at it. Ah, pox on him, poor brainless rook. And you remember, I told him his wit lay at pawn with his new satin suit, and both would be lost for not fetching home by a day. <laughs> at which he would fain a blushed, but that his painted cheeks would not let him. Nay, sir, the palinode, which I mean to stitch to my revels, shall be the best and ingenious piece that ever I sweat for. Stay, rogue, I'll fat thy spleen and make it plump with laughter. Oh, shall I? <laughs> Faith, Ningle, shall I see thy secrets? <sighs> my friends. But what fardel's that? What fardel's that? Fardel? Oh, wait, is my packet. Here lies entombed the loves of knights and earls. Here tis, here tis, here tis, Sir Walter Terrell's letter to me, and uh, my answer to him. I no sooner opened the letter, but uh, there appeared to me three glorious angels whom I adored as subjects to their sovereigns. The uh, honest knight angles for my acquaintance with such golden baits but I'll... why dost thou laugh my good rogue how is my answer pretty how how uh... answer, as god judge me ningle for thy wit thou mayest answer any justice of peace in england i warrant thou writst in a most goodly big hand too i like that and reached as legibly as some that have been saved by their neck furs uh -huh. But how dost thou like the uh, knight's indicting? If I have any judgment, a pox on it, here's worshipful lines indeed, here's <laughs> stuff. But Sarah Ningle, what of fashion is this knight's wit? Of what block? Well, you see, well, well, an ordinary ingenuity, a good wit for a knight, you know how, before God, I am haunted with some of the most pitiful dry gallants. <laughs> Troth, I so think. Good pieces of a landscape show best afar off. Aye, aye, aye. Excellent sumpter horses carry good cloth, but honest rogue, come, what news? What news abroad? I have heard of the horses walking at the top of poles. How ye? And why the captain took our rails upon you most preposterously behind your back? Did you not hear him? A pox upon him. By the white and soft hand of... 
Minerva, I'll make him the most ridiculous. Damn me if I bring not humour at the stage. And scurvy, limping, town captain, poor greasy buff jerkin, hang him! Tis, about, tis out of his element to traduce me. I am too well ranked, Athenius, to be stabbed with his dudgeon wit, Sarah. I'll compose an epigram upon him. Shall go thus. Nay, I have more news. There's Crispinus and his journeyman, poet Demetrius Faninus, too. They swear they'll bring your life and death upon the stage like a bricklayer. <gasps> Bubo, they must press more valiant wits than their own to do it. Me, at the stage! Ha! Ha! I'll starve their poor copulous workmasters that dare play me. I can bring, and that they quake at, a prepared troop of gallants, who for my sake shall distaste every unsalted line in their fly-blown comedies. <laughs> Nay, that's certain. I'll bring a hundred gallants of my rank. Uh, that same Crispinus is the silliest door, and Faninus the slightest cobweb lawn piece of a poet. Oh, God, why should I care what every door doth buzz in credulous ears? It is a crown to me that the best judgments can report me wronged. I am one of them that can report it. I think but what they are, and am not moved. The one, a light, voluptuous reveller. The other, a strange, arrogating puff. Both <laughs> impudent and arrogant enough. Do not criticus revel in these lines. Huh, Ingle? Huh? There's a knocking. Yes, they're mine own. Horace! Marcus! Horace, not up yet? Please tread softly, hide my papers. Who's this so early? Some of my rooks, some of my gulls. Horace, Flaccus! Who's there? Say, tread softly. What terrible. What terrible on my life? Who's there? My gown, sweet rogue. Uh, so, come up, come in. And yes, we'll have the entrance of uh, Crispinus and Demetrius, of whom we've heard so much in a moment. Um, yes, and uh, so uh, it's an interesting scene as we have lots of Ben Johnson jokes in there. Uh, for those who uh, uh, may or may not have got some of those, uh, neck verse, saved by neck verse, Ben Johnson <laughs> being saved uh, from uh, being hanged uh, by knowing a bit of Latin there. Uh, Bricklayer in a play, Ben Johnson. Famous bricklayer, unsalted line, flyblown comedies, me on the stage, ha 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 ha, uh, various little references to uh, uh, Johnson's actual uh, own uh, things. I do like the, you will see my acrostics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we will see more Ben Johnson acrostics later. I don't know if at this point we've actually seen that many on uh, about, but um, certainly later plays will have will have some acrostic uh, action yeah. in their, their introductory material. Um, so that's all the sort of stuff that most people in an audience, but some people will get today, but basically nobody will get um, in the midst of a scene which is sort of generally about a poet struggling to write his, his favourite favorite bit of, uh, you know, write his commission. Um, and there's some nice back and forth. There's all this stuff with tobacco as well, uh, tobacco business, which, of course, is something that Ben Johnson has also written in plays. So that may also be a deliberate spoof of Ben Johnson-y stuff, um, though it is also just generally... Uh, 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 yeah, uh, stuff going on there. Thoughts in the room about this particular mm. scene, Lynn? Yeah, I, I, I am. I kind of wonder how uh, is Horace supposed to be a good poet or not? I mean, in in the play to which this is purportedly a response, he was sort of a character we were supposed to admire. I think sincerely, but you know, his his buddy is named Asinius or Asinius or anyway um oh that's good oh that's so good oh oh that's excellent. that's the best stuff you've ever written uh <laughs> so um yeah are, are we supposed to believe him or is Horace's verse actually supposed to be just drac or or what I wonder 
Yeah, I, I, I don't find Horace's verse awful. I mean, it's yeah. it's not brilliant, but it's not terrible. I mean, you, we've had considerably yeah. Yeah, better yeah. examples of terrible yeah. verse on a stage. You know, it mostly scans. It mostly does what it's supposed to do on the tin. Um, so it's interesting. I think it's more about what the Horace's mode of creation, perhaps, is where we're going with here. Because um, it's, you know, it's quite a lengthy sequence. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I must admit, I loved the way Alexander handled that because I had done the first yeah. prep on it. I couldn't work out what the hell was going on. <laughs> but putting in the hesitations and where he's obviously just searching for the right ride mm. made it work. And I think that would work superbly even now on yeah. stage, even yeah. though most of the parodies were very much of their time and place and would go over the head of probably 99 point whatever percent of the audience mm. um, because they probably have no idea who the hell was being got at. Yes, you can see him with a rhyming dictionary, can't you? Mm. Going t dame, <laughs> right. game, lame, tame. L lame, yeah. lame, lame, that's the one. Uh, Lois. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Johnson had a reputation for being very slow. Uh, mm. It's something that comes up in the, I think, the prologue to Volpone. Uh, so, uh, and he knew it. Uh, so this is presumably, you know, satirizing a, a poet that takes ages to get something written and uh, probably needs a rhyming dictionary, though he doesn't have one. Yeah, mm, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, it's it's that problem of how do you present on stage, uh, you know, slowness or tedium or that kind of thing without it becoming slow and tedious. Uh, yeah. I think this, this, this there's an interesting balancing act to be had here. I mean, ideally, he should only deliver his verse after I don't know the the first baby's been born, you know, to, to celebrate the, the <laughs> wedding. <laughs> the commission doesn't actually get released until you know the funeral. Yeah. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I have heard that in, in, on more than one occasion that Johnson had a reputation for being a laborious writer, which, you know, now we think, yes, so it, it, why is that, a, you know, we, we probably now don't think of that as a problem, but sort of the model, the paradigm that um, th that was dominant in, in this period is that creativity was inspired by muses. So if the muses were talking to you, you all of this, beautiful stuff just flowed out of you that was sort of that was sort of the ideal so someone who had to actually work at it um uh he wasn't he wasn't inspired and somehow that was less you know he wasn't a real poet or, and, and, and so there was that was kind of an, an insult I mean you know I kind of tend to think that people who are careful and and are workman like um are to be admired you know I'm, I'm kind of with Tom Stoppard who says um a craftsmanship without inspiration gives us many useful objects like wickerwork picnic baskets. <laughs> inspiration without craftsmanship gives us modern art. <laughs> so, um, but that 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 wasn't that wasn't the model. And inspiration was was uh, divine. Inspiration was was kind of a paradigm. Was kind of a model. So, mm. uh, Alexandra. Yeah, um, I'm I'm with Lynn on the on the understanding that maybe our perception has changed from uh, artistry is is you, you're not a proper artist if you have to labor for it um, to something more approaching Stoppard's pers perspective. But um, also, um, I'm I'm finding it very interesting that even though in both these scenes they are so. Um, so carefully and well crafted they're so they're so well constructed in a technical sense um however sort of um entertaining or distasteful or you know uh, we we may or may not get the references but we we're getting some very um in in brief in this in the earlier scene uh, in, in in very little bits of text we're getting a, an entire parade of people and we understand what they're after and we understand what they're going and each of them has you know something that they're that they're um, kind of doing as part of this preparation for the wedding um, and you get their relative levels and here you've got a, a two-person scene which again um, gives us a lot of characterization we're supposed to laugh at this person sure um but um it's also very 
kind of there there are elements to it that are very realistically constructed such as you know the the poet struggling to put something together and really really wanting his friend to like the thing he's just written even though it isn't complete um and um also you know the oh gosh there are people coming quick clear up this mess put the papers away hide you know you, you watch where you're uh, treading and then sort of setting himself up before before allowing people in yeah I mean, there's there's sort of interesting questions about how to how to read this uh, text as well um i mean our usual uh, thing is uh, about you know how would it play today um you know so you know the the in jokes are in a sense of doomed and and uh, to a degree uh, just straightforwardly removable because there is an expansiveness to a lot of this text and there's a part of wondering if that's part of the mode of 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 satire as well you know is the play spoofing the sort of expansiveness we found in Ben Johnson plays that we find, you know, is is that what you were not to to a degree what we're not liking at the beginning? Is that whole ex slightly funny, funny opening uh, di discussion between the two gentlewomen is that in itself a s n not supposed to work in a way that is supposed to land? Is is that part of its matrix? And I'm sort of wondering now about uh, you know the mode of how this play functions because a lot of it functions just as a standard play and you could just quietly ignore a lot of the stuff um but there's also just something about how it might be played that is seals very arch um and that changes how you might receive it and of course we can't recapture that we can sort of discuss it and and, and look at it from a distance and uh, and do a close reading on 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 what the bits of the text are doing but i don't know if we can ever capture that mode um that's a general thought. I don't know if there's much one, one could do with that. Uh, anyway, Alan. Yeah, I mean, the other thought you mentioned this, oh, must tidy up. I wonder it's whether because Christmas Demetrius are considered to be plagiarists, so hide all the mm. stuff that I've done just in case they nick it. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, there is that question of how much it is directly referencing uh, the the previous play. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Lois. Yeah, there's this key word, Ningle, which I think we've probably talked about before. But I mean, Asinius is determined to keep calling Horace his Ningle. Mm. Would you Would you like to expand uh, for, for, for for everyone who's forgotten? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, um, I mean, it quite often seems to have the uh, the connotation of. Uh, a sexual partner, but I can't make out whether that's what he's proudly proclaiming here, whether he just means my really, really close friend. Uh -huh. mm. uh, yeah. Well, maybe we'll get more clues. We have stopped mid-scene at the... Oh, Elizabeth. I like the mention of Captain Tooker there. Mm. That was a direct... That was a direct hark back to Poetaster. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and we that. didn't read the 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 prologue. The, the, it wasn't a prologue, but there was like a some spiel before the text started, and there was a mention of Poetaster there as well. Mm. Yes, there is there is additional material in this text uh, that that uh, Decker has laid out for us uh, uh, about the nature of the uh, the back and forth, um, which uh, feel free to read in your own time. <laughs> um, um, but it's not performative, so we're not doing it now. Uh, Lynn, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I know Ingle was an endearment, but I just Googled it and the original meaning is a fireplace. <laughs> I, I wonder My if that... dear fireplace. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that's mm -hmm. significant uh, at all. But, you know, in well, Ingle is the original Ingle. word and then the way... There's Ingle nook. Uh, I mean, an Ingle yeah. nook, I think, is a kind of a seat by a fireplace, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So and the, the end comes from mine Ingle, so... Mm -hmm. um, the way the, the nickname Ned is short for Edward because it's my Ned, my Ned, Ned. It, there's a name in lingu there's a word in linguistics for that phenomenon, but I can't remember what it is. But I, I, I wonder if there's a reason that they chose that particular endearment, Ingle, because it means originally meant fireplace or not. It's just a, it's just, it's just like calling someone honey. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is sort of unusual. It's you would, you would t say that to a child or a, or a lover, not in this kind of mm -hmm. homosocial way normally. Mm -hmm. So that it is, it it is something to notice. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we do need to move on. So we Sorry. are mid scene. Uh, hold on to any thoughts for later on. Uh, so enter Crispinus and Demetrius to Horace and uh, Asinius. 
good morrow, Horace. Oh, God save you, gallant. Astinius Bubo, well met. <laughs> Nay, I hope so, Christmas. Yet I was sick a quarter of a year ago with a vehement great toothache, a pox on it. It bit me vilely, as God save me. And I knew twas you by your knocking so soon as I saw you. Demetrius Fanin, Fanius, will you take a whiff this morning? I have a tickling gear now. Here's that will play with your nose and a pipe of mine, own scouring too. Aye, and a hog's head too of your own, but that will never be scoured clean, I fear. <laughs> I burnt my pipe yesternight and twas never used since. If you will, tis at your service. Gallants and tobacco too. "'Tis right pudding, I can tell you. "'A lady or two took a pipe full or two at my hands "'and praised it for the heavens. "'Shall I fill, Flanius? Uh, "'I thank you, good Asinius, for your love. "'I seldom take that physic. "'Tis enough having so much fool to take him in snuff. "'Good Bubo, read some book and give us leave.' leave have you dear ningle marry for reading any book i'll take my death upon it as ningle says tis out of my element no faith ever since i felt one hit me in the teeth that the greatest clerks are not the wisest men could i abide to go to school i was at as in presenti and left there yet because i'll not be counted a worse fool than i am i'll turn over a new leaf uh, asinius reads and takes tobacco <laughs> <clears throat> to see my fate that when i dip my pen in distilled roses and do strive to get to drain out of mine ink all gall that when i weigh each syllable i write or speak because mine enemies with sharp and searching eyes look through and through me carving my poor labours like an anatomy Oh, heavens, to see that when my lines are measured out as straight and even parallels, tis strange that still, still some imagine they are drawn awry. The error is not mine, but in their eye that cannot take proportions. Horace, Horace, mm -hmm. to stand within the shot of galling tongues proves not your guilt. For could we write on paper, made of these turning leaves of heaven, the clouds, or speak with angels' tongues, yet wise men know that some would shake the head, though saints should sing. Some snakes must hiss, because they're born with stings. Tis true. Do we not see fools laugh at heaven, and mock the maker's workmanship? Be not you grieved if that which you mould fair, upright and smooth, be screwed awry, made crooked, lame and vile, by racking comments and calumnious tongues. So to be bit it rankles not, for innocence may with a feather brush off the foulest wrongs. But when your dastard wit will strike at men in corners and in riddles fold the vices of your best friends, you must not take to heart if they take off all gilding from their pills and only offer you the bitter core. Crispinus. Say that you have not sworn unto your paper to blot her white cheeks with the dregs and bottom of your private of your friend's private vices. Say you swear your love and your allegiance to bright virtue makes you descend so low as to put on the office of an executioner, only to strike off the swollen head of sin, where'er you found it standing. Say you swear and make damnation parcel of your oath that when your lashing jests make all men bleed, yet you whip none. Court, city, country, friends, foes, all must smart alike. Yet court, nor city, nor foe, nor friend, dare winch at you. Great pity. If you swear, damn me, Fannius, or Crispinus, or to the law our kingdom's golden chain, to poets, damn me, or to players, damn me, if I brand you, or you tax you, scourge you, I wonder then that of five hundred, four should all point with their fingers in one instant to one and the same man. D dear Fanny Nurse. You cannot excuse it. D hear me, I can. <laughs> you must daub on thick colours then to hide it. We come like your physicians 
to purge your sick and dangerous mind of her disease. In truth, we do. Out of our loves we come, and not revenge. But if you strike us still, we must defend our reputations. Our pens shall, like our swords, be always sheathed, unless too much provoked, Horace, if then they draw blood of you. Blame us not, we are men. Come, let thy muse bear up a smoother sail. Tis the easiest and the basest art to rail. Deliver me your hands. I love you both as dear as my own soul. Prove me, and when I shall traduce you, make me the scorn of men. Enough. Enough. We're friends. We are friends. What reads Asinius? And uh, I'll step in for that uh, part for the moment. Uh, by my troth, here's an excellent, comfortable book. It's most sweet reading in it. Oh, why? What does it smell of, Bubo? Mass, it smells of rose leaves a little, too. And it must needs be a sweet book. He would fain perfume his ignorance. I warrant he had wit in him that penned it. Tis good, yet a fool will confess truth. Uh, the the wholesome made me meet with a hard style in two or three places as I went over him. I believe thee, for they had need to be very low and easy styles of wit that thy brains go over. Enter Blunt and Tucker. Some clashes may occur. Oh, I'm Blunt. Good heavens. Yes, you are. Um, Hopefully yes. you don't speak literally <laughs> yeah. one after the other. Oh, okay, um, right. Where is this gallant? Uh, morrow, gentlemen, ha, what's this device done yet, Horace? God, so uh, what mean you to let this fellow dog into my chamber? Oh, our honest captain, come, prithee, let us see. Why, you bastards of nine whores, the muses, why do you walk here in this gorgeous gallery of gallant in inventions with that horse and poor lime and hair rascal? Why? Oh, peace, good Tucker. We are all sworn friends. Sworn? That Judas yonder that walks in rug will dub you Knights of the Post. If you serve under his band of oaths, the copper-fact rascal will, for a good supper, outswear twelve dozen of grand juries. A uh, pox aren't not done yet. And been about it three days. I jeez you within this hour. Save you, Captain Tucker. Damn thee, damn that thou thin-bearded hermaphrodite, damn thee, I'll save myself for one, I warrant thee. Is this thy tub, Diogenes? Yes, Captain, this is my poor lodging. Oh, uh, morrow, uh, Captain Tucker, will you whiff this morning? Art thou there, goat's pizzle? No, God a mercy, Cain, I am for no whiffs, I. Come hither, sheepskin weaver. Sfoot, thou look'st as though thou thadst begged out of a jail. Draw, I mean not thy face, for tis not worth drawing, but draw near. This way, march, follow your commander, you scoundrel. So, thou must run of an errand for me, Mephistopheles. To do your pleasure, Captain, I will, but whether? To hell, thou knowest the way. To hell, my fire and brimstone, to hell. Dost stare my sarsen's head at Newgate? Dost gloat? I'll march through thy Dunkirk's guts for shooting jests at me. D dear Captain, but one word. Out, bench whistler, out. I'll not take thy word for a dagger pie, you brown bread mouth stinker. I'll teach thee to turn me into Banks's, Banks's his horse, and to tell gentlemen I am a juggler and can show tricks. Ah, uh, Captain Tucker, but, but with half a word in your ear. No, you starved rascal. Thou'lt bite mine ears, then. You must have three or four suits of names. When, like a lousy, pediculous vermin, thus but one suit to thy back, you must be called Asper, and Criticus, and Horace. Thy titles longer are reading than the style of the big Turks. Asper, Criticus, Quintus, Horatius, Flaccus. Hey, Captain, I know upon what even bases I stand, and therefore... Bases? 
Would the rogue were but ready for me? Nay, prithee, dear Tucker, come. You shall shake. Not hands with great hunks there. Not hands, but I'll shake the gold groper out of his tanned skin. Oh, oh, for our sake, Captain, Captain prithee, hold. Nay, prithee, hold. Thou wrongest here a good honest rascal, Crispinus, and a poor varlet, Demetrius Faninus, brethren in thine own trade of poetry. Thou sayest Crispinus' satin doublet is ravelled out here, and that this penurious sneaker is out at elbows. Go to, my good full-mouthed band-dog, I'll have thee friends with both. With, 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 with all my heart, Captain Tucker, and with you too, I'll lay my hands under your feet to keep them from aching. How can you have any more? Sayest thou me so, old Cole? Come, do it then. Yet tis no matter neither. I'll have thee in league first with these two roly polies. They shall be thy daemons, and thou and thou their Pythias. Crispinus shall give thee an old cast satin sweet, and Demetrius shall write thee a scene or two in one of thy strong garlic comedies, <laughs> and thou shalt take the guilt of conscience fort, and swear tis thine own lad, tis thine own. Thou never yet felt felst into the hands of satin, didst. I never, Captain, I thank God. Go to. Thou shalt now, King Gorboduc, thou shalt, because I'll have thee damned, I'll have thee all in satin, Asper, Criticus, Quintus, Horatius, Flaccus, Crispinus, shall do it, thou shalt do it, heir apparent of Hel Helicon, thou shalt do it. Fine ingle, wear an old cast satin suit. Aye, wafer face, your ningle. If he carry the mind of a gentleman, he'll scorn at its heels. Marry, Muff, my man, a gingerbread, wilt eat any small coal. No, Captain, would you should well know it. A great coal shall not fill my belly. Scorn it. Dost scorn to be arrested at one of his old suits? Oh, uh, no, Captain, I'll wear anything. <laughs> I know thou wilt, I know thou'rt an honest low-minded pygmy, for I have seen thy shoulders lapped in a player's old cast cloak, like a sly knave as thou art. And when thou ranst mad for the death of Horatio, thou borrowedst a gown of Rossius the stager, that honest Nicodemus, and sensed it home lousy, didst not? Respond, didst not? So, so, uh, no more of this, within this hour, I, if I can sound retreat to my wits, uh, with whom this leader is in skirmish, I'll end within this hour. What? What end? What hang thyself now? Has he not writ finis yet, Jack? What will he be fifteen weeks about this cockatrice's egg, too? Has he not cackled yet? Not laid yet? Uh, not yet. He, he swears he will within this hour. His wits are somewhat hard bound. The punk, his muse, has sore labour ere the whore he be de ere the whore be delivered. The poor saffron cheek, sunburnt gypsy, wants physic. Give the hungry face pudding pie eater ten pills, ten shillings, my fair Angelica. They'll make his muse as yar as as yar as a tumbler. He shall not want for money if he'll write. Go by Geronimo. Go. And here, drop the ten shillings into this basin. Do drop. When, Jack? He shall call me his Mycenus. Besides, I'll damn up oven mouth for railing at. So, is't right, Jack? Is't sterling? Fall off now to the vanward of yonder four stinkers, and ask aloud if we shall go. The night shall defray, Jack, the night when it comes to summer totalis, the night, the night. Uh, well, gentlemen, we'll leave you. Uh, shall we go, Captain? Uh, good Horace, make some haste. I'll put on wings. <laughs> I never saw my needle so dashed in my life before. Uh, and Crispinus, yes, once, Asinius. 
Mass, you say true. He was dashed wa one, worse once going in a rainy day with a speech to the tilt yard. By God's lid has called him names. A dog would not put up that, any, that had any discretion. Hold, hold up thy hand. I have seen the day thou didst not scorn to hold up thy gold. Here's a spider's spur royal, twelve pence. Stay, because I know thou canst not write without quicksilver. Up again, this goal again. I give thee double press money. Stay, because I know thou hast a noble head. I'll divide my crown, O royal porex. There's a test and more. Go thou, and thy muse munch. Do munch. Come, my dear mandrake, if skeldring fall not to decay, thou shalt flourish. Farewell, my sweet Amastagall, farewell. Amadeus. Dear Captain. Come, Jack. Nay, Captain, stay. We, we are of your band. March fair, then. Horace, farewell. Adieu, Asinius, Exeunt, uh, Crispinus, and Demetrius. Mingle, let's go to some tavern and dine together, for my stomach rises at this scurvy, scurvy leather captain. And oh, they have choked me with mine own disgrace, which <laughs> fools I'll spit again even in your face! And exit. So, yeah, Horace has been writing <laughs> naughty things about other people and they're not very happy. Uh, always nice to have a reference to Banks's horse. Uh, the <laughs> Banks has a very famous horse, can perform tricks, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's well known uh, out and about there. It's nice nice reference we get every so and lots of little references to plays and things. Uh, Tucker just can't seem to stop just yeah. referencing plays. It just seems to be what what they do, uh, and and other things as well, as well as just. Tucker just loves their <laughs> loves their insults, doesn't Tucker? Doesn't Tucker like mm. love opening everything with a, 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 a an insulting gambit? Um, so yeah, uh, Alan. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, we thought we'd invented early modern bingo, but they do seem to be playing a version <laughs> of it here. Mm. You know, they they must be at least for a line, if not a full house already. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is not just uh, satire necessarily delivered uh, at one person. It is also throwing in lots of meta theatrical jokes all over the shop. So uh, it's it's uh, it's very knowing all the way through this. Um, and of course, there'll be you know references that we're not getting because there'll be references to plays that we don't have anymore, and so we'll we, we won't understand what they are. Um, but yeah, there's an awful lot in there. Um, Horace, you, you you you. I think you said in the chat you were feeling very put upon. Um, <laughs> I was feeling bullied. Um, I, I think we get. <clears throat> I think it's nice uh, the juxtaposition here. We get very much a sense of of who this person is in private with his friends, um, or with his admirers, and what he's like actually in in writing as well as in the presence of his betters as it were so you know he's uh according to what taka says and and uh, uh the other one uh, you know he's terribly terribly um um not accusatory whatever it is biting in his writing but in person he's an absolute coward and i i liked the i mean it in the text itself, he is clearly very put upon. But also, I liked the the mental picture that these two are both much bigger than him, and you know Tucker at least is literally manhandling him and moving him around and kind of you know very high school bully kind of behaviour. Mm. Um, that's just the mental picture I got. Yeah, and the the way that Demetrius and Crispinus, when they first arrive, uh, that it, it does it sort of couched as an intervention. Look, you've got a bit of a problem. You just you know you've got to stop writing this stuff because it's not going down well. Um, and you know, and also references that feel like pointed references to Poetaster as well. We come like your physicians to purge your sick and dangerous mind of her disease. It's it's immediately uh, conjuring that uh, uh, as well as being perfectly sensible within its own context. Uh, Brian. Yeah, that felt a bit as well as the, the early modern bingo going on there. I felt reading Tucker that it was kind of like a how many how many different minorities can I offend bingo just <laughs> in his own speeches. Like, yeah, that, that was uncomfortable. Yeah, and I mean, it's a very self-indulgent 
seen. I mean, it, it clearly is because it's satire. So it's, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure it's, it was hilarious then and we can appreciate the references now. But yeah, there's, there's so much of it and it, it's unrelenting and it just keeps going. Uh, whereas you feel that, you know, whereas it feels like the wedding plot that's happening somewhere else at the moment, it feels like that's the play that they were possibly writing earlier and then <laughs> this stuff goes let's let's put lots of this stuff in oh we can make that fit together can't we um it it, it does feel like it's a it's a very different beast uh lois yeah there's not very much yet that really characterizes uh marston and uh, decker who are uh, i take it crispinus and demetrius but there is this one bit where tucker says that, you know they're going to be his daemon and well they'll be daemon and he'll be pythias which of course is a reference to that famous friendship but he says crispinus uh, she'll give thee an old satin, old cast satin suit, and Demetrius shall write thee a scene or two in one of thy strong garlic comedies. Uh, I mean, Marston came from a much richer background than Decker, uh, who was in debtor's prison for quite a bit of his life. And uh, so he can give him, you know, uh, uh, satin suits that he's not wearing anymore, whereas all Demetrius can do. And apparently Decker did often write scenes and even speeches and other plays just to make a little bit more money so i mean it's the only place where i can really see something that sounds like these two guys and biographically mm, yeah and uh, of course we do have a dramatic version of damon and pythias uh, uh, an earlier one there was a there was a more contemporary version that was about that we don't have uh, so uh, it, it that is also again uh, a, a reference to actual works uh, going on uh, at the time uh, alexandra it also feels like uh, somehow a, a gentler way of of uh, expressing of satirizing this person, um, Johnson through the character of Horace, by the author's self inserts being genuinely supportive and helpful. And look, you've got a problem, and and we're your friends, um, and we want to help you. And the people who make him look belittle him and make him look awful in the eyes of the audience are other people mm. yes and of course we don't know whether those other people are also representations of some person i mean there's something about a massively over the top shouty person that couldn't possibly feel like they might be an actor um <laughs> I, I, I just, but you know there's nothing particularly solid there to actually grab hold of um but that might be a thing who knows anyway we need to move on we've got one more scene to do uh, we've only done two scenes um uh and uh, yeah this is where we return to what we might call plot um or the other plot or one of the other plots it's uh, there's actually quite a lot going on in this play um uh, or will be one we get a bit further into it uh, uh, so scene three Enter Sir Quintilian's short hose, who, if nothing else, has a fantastic name. Uh, <laughs> Sir Adam Savorn Miniver uh, with serving men. Knaves, varlets, what, Lunges, give me a dozen of stools there. Should you please us all in a five senses apiece? What mean ye, Sir Quintilian short hose, to stand so much on a dozen stools? It be not preachers enough to hide a dozen stools. Unless you wish some us to break his shins. I say, Sir Vaughan, no shin shall be broken here. What, Lugus? A chair with a strong <coughs> back and a, and a soft belly, great with child, with a cushion for this reverend lady. God never gave me the grace to be a lady, yet I have worship, been worshipped in my conscience to my face a thousand times. I cannot deny, Sir Vaughan, but that I have all implements belonging to the vocation of a lady. I trust, Mistress Minerva, you have all an honest woman should have. Yes, Purdy. As my coach and my fan, and a man or two that serve my turn, and other things which I'd be loath every one should see, because they shall not be common, I am in manner of a lady in one point. Pray, Mrs. Minerva, let us see all that point for our better understanding. For I have some things that were fetched, I'm sure, as far as some of the low countries, and I paid sweetly for them too, and they told me they were good for ladies. <laughs> and much good do it, thy good heart, fair widow, with them. I'm fair enough to be a widow, Sir Quintilian. My soul and conscience, well enough, well favoured enough to be a lady. Here is Sir Quintilian's short house, 
and here is Sir Adam Prickshaft, a gentleman of very good brain, well headed. You see, he shoots his bolt seldom, but when Adam lets go, he hits. Near us have borne up, Reese, and I believe if God should take us all from his mercy, as I hope he will not yet, we all three love you at the bottom of our bellies and our hearts. And therefore, Mistress Miniver, if you please, you shall be knighted by one of us, whom you shall desire to put into your device and mind. One I must have, Sir Vaughan. And one of us thou shalt have, widow. One I must have, for now every one seeks to crow over me. I say so. And if I find any crowing over you and he were a cock, come out as far as in the turkey's country, it is possible to cut his comb off. I muse, why Sir Adam Prickshaft flies so far from us? I am in a brown study, my dear. If love should be turned into a beast, what beast he were fit to be turned into? I think Sir Adam an ass because of his bearing. I think, saving your reference, Sir Adam a puppy, for a dog is the most loving creature to a Christian that is, unless it be a child. No, I think if love should be turned away and go to serve any beast, it must be an ape, and my reason... Sir Adam, an ape? There's no more reason in an ape than a very plain monkey, for an ape has no tail, but we all know, or it is our duty to know, love has two tails. In my judgment, if love be a beast, that beast is a bunch of redis. For a bunch of redis is wise meat without mutton. So is love. There's the yawning captain, saving your reverence that has such a sore mouth. Would one day needs persuade me that love was a ribato, and his reason was, saving your reverence, that a ribato was worn out with pinning too often. And so he said love was. And Master Captain Tucker said wisely too. Love is a rebato indeed. A rebato must be boat. Now, now many women wear rebatos and many wear the, the wear rebatos. But must be poked. Sir Adam Pritchard has hit the clout. Music plays. The music speaks to us. We'll have a dance before dinner. Uh, enter the water. Uh, yes, enter Sir Walter Tyrrell, uh, uh, Celestine, Blunt, Crispinus and Demetrius, every one with a lady. All together the now. At the king's at hand! The king's, the king's, the king's at, at hand. hand! Father, the king's at hand. Music talk louder, that thy silver voice may reach my sovereign's ears. Pray do so. Musicians, bestir your fingers, that you may have us all by the ears. His grace comes, a hall, varlet, where be my men? Blow, blow your cold trumpet till they sweat. Tickle them with they till they sound again. A best go meet his grace. Agreed. Agreed. Pray all stand bare, as well men as women. Sir Adam is best you hide your head, for fear your wise brains take key cold. On a four, Sir Quintilian. Gentlemen, fall in before the ladies in seemly orders and fashion. So this is comely. Enter trumpet sounding. <laughs> they go to the door and meet the king and his train. And whilst the trumpeters sound, the king is welcomed, <clears throat> kisses the bride, and honours the bridegroom in dumb show. So dumb show. <laughs> Nay, if your pleasures shrink at sight of us, we shall repent this labour, Mistress Bride. You that for speaking but one word today must lose your head at night. You that do stand taking your last leave of virginity. You that being well begun must not be made. When you the ladies, I the men will woo, ourself will lead my blushing bride with you. God bless your majesty. Send you to be a long King William Rufus over us when he sees his time and pleasures. We thank you, good Sir Vaughan. We will take your meaning, not your words. <laughs> Loud music there. I'm glad your majesty would take anything at my hands. My words I trust in Chisu, and spoken between my soul and body together, and have neither felonies nor treasons about them, I hope. 
Good word, Savon. I pray thee, give us leave. Word, Savon? That's by, by interpretation in English. You best give good words, Savon. God and his angels bless me. What ails his majesty to be so tedious and difficult in his right minds now? I hold my life that file rascal rhyme up Horace that puzzed and puzzed above a hundred merry tales and lice into his great and princely ears. My God, and he use it. His being Phoebus mm. priest cannot save him. If he were his safe line too, I'd please upon his coxum. Good Lord, bless me out of his majesty's cellar. King Williams, I hope tis none offences to make a supplication to God Almighty for your long life. For oh, by Jesu, I have no meaning in it in all the world, unless rascals be here that will have your grey state shape for she's, and unless Horace has sent lice to your majesty. Horace? What's he, Sir Vaughan? As hard favoured a fellow as your majesty has seen in a summer's day. Does pen, and please your grace, toys that will not please your grace. Tis a poet. We call them bards in our country. Sings ballads and rhymes. And I was mighty jealous that his ink, which is black and full of gall, had brought my name to his majesty, and so lift up your high and princely collar. I neither know that Horace, nor my anger, if, as thou sayest, our high and princely collar be up, we'll tread it down with dances. Ladies, loose not your men. Fair measures must be tread, when by so fair a dancer you are led. Mistress Minerva. Per di Savon, I cannot dance. Perdi by this Minerva cap, and according to his majesty's leave too, you shall be put in among these ladies, and dance ere long. I trust in God, the shaking of the seats. They dance a strain, and whilst the others keep on, the king and Celestine stay. That turn, fair bride, shows you must turn at night, in that sweet dance which steals away delight. Uh, then pleasure is a thief, uh, a fit, a uh, fever. True, he's the thief, but women the receiver. There's another change, they fall in, the rest go on. The change, sweet maid, says you must change your life, as virgins do. Virgins ne'er change their life. She that has wived a maid is maid and wife. But she that dies a maid... Her thrice happy, then. ...leads apes in hell. Better lead apes than men. At this third change they end, and she meets the king. Well met. Tis overtaken. Why, fair sweet? Women are overtaken when they meet. Your blood speaks like a coward. It were good if every maiden blush had such a blood. A coward blood? Why, whom should maidens fear? Men were maids cowards. They'd not come so near. My lord, the measure's done. I plead my duty. Only my heart takes measure of thy beauty. Now by my hose, I swear there's no depot. This was a fine, sweet earthquake gently moved by the soft wind of whispering silks. Come, ladies, whose joints are made out of dancing orbs, come, follow me. Walk a cold measure now in the bride's chamber. Your hot beauties melt. Take everyone her fan, give them their place, and wave the northern wind upon your face. Celestine and all the ladies doing obeisance to the king, who only kisses her. Exuant short hose manning them, the gallants stand aloof. Sir Walter Terrell. My confirmed liege. Beauty out of her bounty thee hath lent, more than her own with liberal extent. What means, my lord? Thy bride, thy choice, thy wife, she that is now thy fadom, thy new world, that brings thee people and makes little subjects, kneel at thy feet, obeying everything, so every father is a private king. My lord, her beauty is the poorest part, Chiefly her virtues did endow my heart. Do not backbite her beauties, they all shine, brighter on thee because the beams are thine. To thee more fair, to others her two lips, show like a parted moon in thine eclipse. 
That glance which lovers amongst themselves devise walks as invisible to others' eyes. Give me thine ear. What means the king? It is a quaint strain. My lord. Thou darest not what? She is too coarse an object for the court. Thou darest not what? Let tonight be tomorrow. For she's not yet mine own. Thou darest not what? My lord, I dare, but... But I see thou darest not. This night. Yea, this night. Tush, thy mind repairs not. The more thou talkest of night, the more thou darest not. Thus far I tend, I would but turn this sphere of lady's eyes and place it in the court, where thy fair bride should for the zodiac shine, and every lady else sit for a sign. But all thy thoughts are yellow, thy sweet blood rebels, rebels. Thou art jealous, what? Thus with proud revels, to emulate the masking firmament, where stars dance in the silver hall of heaven, thy pleasure should be seasoned, and thy bed relish thy bride. But... But thou darest not what? My lord, I dare. Speak that again. I dare. Again, kind what? And then I know thou darest. I dare and will by that joint holy oath which she and I swore to the book of heaven. This very day when the surveying sun rose like a witness to her faith and mine, by all the loyalty that subjects owe to majesty, by that, by this, by both, I swear to make a double-guarded oath. This night, untainted by the touch of man, she shall a virgin come. To court? To court. I know I took a woman to my wife, and I know women to be earthly moons that never shine till night. I know they change their orbs, their husbands, and in sickish hearts, steal to their sweet endymions to be cured with better physic sweeter diet drinks than home can minister all this i know yet know not all but give me leave o king to boast of mine and say that i owe that i know none i have a woman but not such a one why she's confirmed in thee i now approve her if constant in thy thoughts who then can move her Enter Sir Quintil uh, Quintilian. <laughs> Will it please your highness take your place within? The ladies attend the table. I go. Good night. What thy oath? My lord, my oath's my honour, my honour is my life, my oath is constant, so I hope my wife. And they exit. Yes, the importance there of knowing that the na the the name what is uh, is a name, not uh, not uh, not not what. Um, I thought it was what. Yeah, it's yeah. Name. It's, it's, uh, it's um, like Walt, it's an issue Walter. of punctuation and capitalisation there. Um, oh. It's probably more Walt, really. It, it should, uh, should that's yeah. the, you know the, the, as because he's Walter, isn't he? Um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's sometimes yeah. Tidy up the script there. We'll make that much easier to read. <laughs> um, so yes, um, we we I throw in the the question of uh, is this a history play? And if this is a history play, how does this connect with the previous history play? Because these are two very different time periods we're working with. If this is William Rufus, that's not going to connect with <laughs> Augustus. Um. <laughs> Unless Horace lived for an incredibly long period of time, <laughs> uh, though there might be some plot spoilers in that statement. Um, so, yeah, um, odd things happening at this wedding. Um, so, yeah, King sort of intervening, saying, uh, OK, let's not complete the nuptials. And... Uh, just in terms of the way this scene is structured with dancing and uh, and people dancing and then returning to dialogue and a uh, uh, a figure like Minerva uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Savorn doing their back and forth um yeah it is it is very reminiscent of some Marston stuff that we've uh, looked at mm -hmm. uh, if indeed Marston has a hand in this there's bits of this where I'm going oh yes I could I could buy that I could buy that um but it's entirely possible it's not I don't know it's not my field I don't really care. Anyway, uh, but it is similar. Uh, Lynn. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not sure I followed. The king is trying to seduce 
the bride and somehow makes a bet with her husband that I bet you can't hold out for one night. It's it's not it's... actually clear whether the king actually has in absolute intentions on that front yet. I don't know if the text has actually said that. He just seems to be doing some weird test thing. At okay, the yeah, because I, I was guessing that he's decided he wants her, but he wants her first. So he doesn't want the marriage to be consummated so she can come to court and he can begin his affair with her while she's still a virgin. Or what? The language is so opaque you know nobody says what they really mean everything's couched in metaphor mm. i mean deliberately but uh, that and the uh and the distance of time it just uh, i couldn't follow what was going on yes i mean it's a question of which is more ricky the idea that the king just wants to sleep with his subjects um uh in this way or whether he has a weird virginity thing um i'm, I'm not actually oh, sure which is which is slightly more disturbing um <laughs> lois yeah i mean uh I think that that bit where he keeps saying, you know, you don't dare, no, you don't dare, is quite effective. I mean, it keeps us wondering what on earth he's talking about, because he could hardly be saying, you don't dare let me sleep with your wife or let me sleep with your wife before you do. Or, but I mean, there could be some vague allusion to that. What is it called? Jus prima noctis, the, uh, you know, the Lord of the manor has the right to sleep with the, the brides of his subjects before they do. Uh, which Freud apparently thought was devised because of a sort of virginity taboo and the idea that to have somebody else break someone's virginity, put the sort of penalty for it on them rather than on the husband, which is an interesting idea. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I don't know whether that's what's going on here. I mean, he, the king just has that short exchange with Celestine, who doesn't seem to be encouraging him at all. Mm. Uh, and then uh, seems to want something. Uh, and it's still not really very clear. I mean, whether it's just what uh, what uh, is supposed to bring her to to court, and then see what happens. Or he, he's been trying to keep her away from the court, understandably, given the way the king seems to be thinking. And uh, now he's agreed to bring her to show that he trusts her. Mm. Uh, and this is following on from a sort of uh, a social satire sort of situation of uh, of, of the, just the way that I like Sir Quinn just going loud music uh, for when Sir Vaughan is talking because Sir Vaughan <laughs> says words, lots of words that um, uh, the king is witty enough at least to go, I, I know what you mean, mate. Um, maybe you should stop talking now. Uh, she doesn't take uh, quite the right way. Uh, Lynn then Alan. Oh, yeah, just a question. So where is Sir Vaughan supposed to be from, or does he just have a speech impediment? What? He's Welsh, isn't he? He's supposed yeah. to be Welsh, I think. Yeah. yeah, another of these Decker tricks, you know, when in doubt, bring on a Welshman. Mm. <laughs> but it's very unevenly written in terms mm. of a Welshness, uh, in terms of sometimes it seems to be written in some sort of logic of phoneticism, and then sometimes it's just not. And it's, so uh, I don't know whether that's just accidental editorial shifting or whether that's uh, that's original textual stuff. Uh, Lynn, uh, muted at present. No, you're done. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I mean... That on that very point, on the way that Vaughan stuff is written, that is kosher to the uh, PDF I checked it against. Mm. Um, so if it was written even heavily, more heavily in Cod Welsh, um, that's disappeared between the time of original publication and the 19th century edition that was what I was working from. Mm. So there might, there might be, but I, I it thought a, it would be more e e evenly distributed yeah. if they had updated it. So I, I or, or changed and it. it and it was an absolute bugger to try and work out how to do the mispronunciations. Mm. 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 Yes, because there, there are some strange conventions about what accents should be like, uh, which may, of course, be mm. authentic uh, iterations of what accents would have been like. But of course, might not be. Alexandra. Um, I think there's something interesting going on that might elucidate what the king is doing with Terrell um, in the dance before that, where the Doug King is dancing with Celestine. And um, we, in the in the version of the script that we are looking at, this isn't formatted to look like they're completing each other's lines. But if you were to do it that way, uh, they would be doing, uh, um, they would be constructing uh, rhymed couplets together, which is a uh, wooing technique, I'm told, um, from, a, from a, a writer's standpoint. Um, so you get things like, 
Um, oh, I, I, I can't find an example. Well, well met, it is overtaken. Why, fair sweet? Women are overtaken when they meet. Um, and that's four lines. That's an exchange between them. Um, Which is only actually really two lines because mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the actual meter of the verse. Yes, sorry, it's four speeches, two lines of text, yeah. yes. So it would go, uh, it, it, would, it would have to have a rhythm and it would have to have some, some detail of the performance. And I think as an audience, we would be understanding that, this, that there's some wooing going on. Mm. Um, it also goes with the dance, the actual, just that particular right. exchange. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the third change they end and it's immediately well met, which suggests a collision or a pull together. Um, so it suggests action with the uh, with the actual the line itself. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, no. Um, so basically, the the king has been dancing three measures only with Celestine, um, and then there's a stage direction that says Celestine and all the ladies doing obeisance to the king, who only kisses her. And then his next line is, um, "Dude, who is her husband? Come over here for a second. Um, and um, so yes, there's there's something. Uh, there is definitely something going on that I think as an audience we wouldn't necessarily, an audience of the time wouldn't necessarily need cluing into as much as an audience of right now might. Um, and also something to, to do with the time, um, those dares not what, say that again, I dare, I dare, I dare, um, those, those lines um, are sort of there's a bit of fun with repeated cues going on there if you do it uh, sort of if you if you prepare your part from cues um which also would indicate that that's a that's a very that's a terrifically quick ex exchange and a lot of very confusing attempts to speak over each other potentially i don't know i i was wondering about the pacing of that 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 cuz some of that could be incredibly slow um and the 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 thing and it's also the the difference potentially in uh, rehearsal um practices between a boys company and a, and an adult company which uh, potentially are quite different because of the nature of how they uh, the the turnover of their repertoire elizabeth i think no yeah it's... i was Yes, I was just really fascinated by Alexandra's um, points there, and about the, the 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 pace of the text determining the meaning. I thought that was really really fascinating. And then I was just I was just really um, I was really kind of struck by how much this feels Johnsony, you know, because uh, we've got these. Re I was just like, how much is that? Um, is it Decker and Marston, and how much is that? a parody of Johnson here, because I feel like in terms of pace, in terms of the length of scenes, in terms of the verbosity of some of the characters, in terms of the way the characters are drawn, that it's it's a parody, but it's really close to Johnson. More than a parody, um, there's a bit, a bit of sense of a home homage, or is mm. that just me? No, I, I think it's a really good question, actually, of, you know, um what this play overall tonally is doing how and how layered it, it is as a piece of uh, uh, satire and pastiche or spoof um, it, or homage. I think homage is a really good question as well. You know, is there, yes, there is a tax, but also there might be uh, something otherwise and clever going on here, which makes it, again, a really difficult text to, uh, to decide because I've been constantly thinking, what does one do with a play like this? Because uh, what register do you, do you do you read it and until we get to the end i think it's gonna be very hard to make a decision about what play you're performing because I, I i think we don't really we haven't really fully engaged with all of the plot lines yet the plot lines are taking a while to get going because there's so much individual <laughs> attacks on johnson that we we, we spent a good hour <laughs> getting through i mean that that whole bit introducing horace could be about five minutes long rather than 25 um yeah. because it's not really necessary for us because, you know, unless you're doing it in a double bill with Poetaster and any other War of the Theatres play, and that's um, that's a that's a big ask. Um, Cynthia's Revels would be quite one to have to get through. Uh, Lynn, yeah, I think that's a nice observation. That the I mean, if we've got two threads here: the Horace thread and the marriage plot thread. The Horace thread particularly feels very Johnsonian. It's very male. It's very Yang. You know, the dude bros hanging out together, 
the sort of frat boy vibe. Um, very reminiscent of scenes from, I think maybe later Johnson, like um, Epicene. Um, but um, it's less, it, it, that that sort of Johnson vibe is is way less apparent in um, in the marriage plot. Johnson was really not interested in erotics. He was really, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to seduce the emperor's wife. Ooh, that'll be a cool scene. And Johnson doesn't write it, you know. So, <laughs> uh, it's, so it's kind of like we've got a Johnson play in parallel with another play. Mm. Yeah, and 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 yeah, and it's trying to assess their individual as well as their collective uh, overlapping because you know the, the the this if we call this the A plot is intersecting mm. with the B plot. I mean, Horace is supposed mm. to be writing a thing for this event. Um, right. And, you know, we'll we'll see updates on that later. Um, so, but yeah, this 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 feels much more akin with the other, say, Marston plays that we looked at and some elements of uh, Decker and, and all of those, 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 those sort of universes. Um, um, yeah. So we're into extra time uh, i'm not going to ask you you know for you know performance ideas of this or anything like that or even really full assessments of the, the text i think we definitely need more data to go on to really assess what the what to do with this text because uh, there's a lot that's interesting there's a lot that's disturbing um but then again depending on the mode in which it's delivered um that does slightly change the meaning of what the text is doing um but yeah uh final thoughts around the room uh elizabeth have you uh had, uh, any final thoughts to throw in about the place so far feel free to call me what um because that was a that was a mistake i made i was really i was thinking that it was like a phrase a turn of phrase and it was not it was a name but um i'm really enjoying this um, it's it's not laugh out loud funny, but it's like a chuckle and a murmur type funny. So I'm really, really enjoying it so far. And I was just thinking, oh, I really hope it doesn't succumb to the curse of the final session because it's it's really working. And I was thinking of histriomastics as well and how much I enjoyed that and how well this, I feel, works with like blurt and... Um, I think that's also called the Spaniard's Night Wolf, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Blurt, Blurt and um, Poetaster and how well they work together. And I was almost like, is it is it a, a thing for them to put in additions Poetaster with satiro, Satiromastics? Because I found an addition and it was together and I thought, oh, that's really cool. Mm. Yes, because the two are, are are talking to each other. In fact, all of the plays that we've been doing recently have all been from the same period. I mean, they're all within a, you know, we, we are currently working mostly chronologically. So the plays that are coming out are sort of a few months apart in some places or in, you know, in a few weeks apart in, in others, potentially, depending on dating protocol. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're, we are very much getting a slice of what the theatre scene of 1601 is doing um uh, or thereabouts and uh yeah I, I i think that they are talking to each other and and you know it's it, it's it's that thing of they they're all different doing slightly different things and but they are all similar and yeah uh briny any final thoughts how, how are you getting along with this one I kind of feel like I'm only understanding about 15 to 20 percent of this to be honest um I don't know like I'm and I'm getting in places I'm getting the shape and in places it's quite a clear shape but like the actual words I can just feel so much of it and I don't think it's just because of the haircut just yeah going right over my head so yeah hopefully things will become clearer as we read more Yes, maybe being deliberately verbose to be a bit like Johnson is a trap, uh, if indeed that's what the author is doing, rather than the author just feels particularly verbose. Um, yeah, uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's it's moving at an interesting pace, um, somewhat less draggy than the previous Johnsons we've run. Um, <clears throat> I must admit, I my favourite characters, I think, so far are the... Um, 
Sir Vaughan and Mistress Minerva, who I think could be played almost like the Senadie in The Glums. Um, you know, it was sort of comedy double act pretty well because you've got that lovely opening line which zipped past with people probably scarcely noticing it where um, oh, one of you go to the bride and one goes to the groom and Vaughan immediately says, oh, well, I'll go to the bride. Um, you know, th there is quite a bit of stuff that can be paid for fairly broad comedy in mm. those roles. Mm. Yes, Miss, uh, Mistress Minerva, who has, um, you know, all this, this flock of admirers, uh, or, at, uh, or at least in theory, um, and, and how that functions as well. There, there, there's, the, yes, there's more to be said about that that we haven't said. Uh, Lois, any final thoughts? I suppose the only thing I'm wondering is what uh, a fair number of the audience must have known who R William Rufus was and also who Walter uh, uh, Tyrrell Terrell, Terrell was, and uh, we'll be expecting something rather different from the mm. general direction this thing seems to be going. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yes, uh, especially from a boys' company as well, yeah. um, uh, or when, when, as when performed by a boys' company. Uh, yes, this is not this is not the William Rufus I'm familiar with. It has to be said, <laughs> um, so which is why I was suggesting that possibly. He wasn't suggesting what he was suggesting, um, but we shall see. Uh, Alexandra, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, a lot of this is is definitely a play a cliff, um, and we've we've lost the cliff, um, uh, or, or or you know we're we're kind of having to infer it, and we don't have all the all the answers, um, which is which is affecting us as a as a modern audience, both in terms of. Um, how how to wrap our heads around it but also that really essential aspect of watching theater do i care about these people or who who among these people should i care about and i think you're right rob we've we've not reached it's weird because we're about a third of the way into the play um and yet we've not reached a point where where either of those questions have been answered um and then a point i was making in the um uh chat is uh it's putting me in mind of um what we nowadays have as sort of um satirical political satire shows or sketch shows or um things like saturday night live where the satire isn't always of politics um but this aspect of as an audience you would immediately understand what is being referenced what about it what about those people is being poked fun at and also that it's the latest and most recent kind of you know it's ripped from the headlines um or it's something very typical um obviously besides the fact that we've lost that about about these authors in particular i don't think it's just about these individuals i think there's a lot more in these plays that is contemporary understanding and and as an audience you would get uh all of t t tucker's references to popular plays and you would get all of um someone else's kind of um t t someone like uh, vaughan's welsh ticks you know they're not just general vague welshness there's there's specifics that that are addressed with that um which, yeah, is poses the problem as to how to and why to do that, to bring these any of these plays onto the stage now. Mm. Uh, so I will uh, push back on on just the the, the question about caring about in, uh, characters uh, in that way. I mean, that is a mode. It is not an it is not an absolute uh, that you have to have in in in, in plays. And I, I especially think it's it's an issue with anything to do with this kind of satirical comedy or any comedy uh, of the humours, where actually that is not what the text is trying to do at all. And the text has no interest in doing it. So to say that, do we care about any of them? Is 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 you're, we're looking in the wrong place for that? Uh, I don't think the text is doing that. Uh, it may do. It may do later. We may find we do care, uh, and it may matter. But it might not, um, because of the nature of the text uh, at hand. Uh, the question is: Is it interesting? Uh, is perhaps a, 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 a different a different way of uh, to, what what is it about it that is uh, maintaining interest uh lynn any final thoughts no. um yes I, so 
Uh, you know, we've talked a, a, a lot about the the, the 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 sort of topical references and this this play as an entry in the in the in the wars of the theaters and oh that's a, a dig at Johnson or that's a compliment to Johnson. Da, 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 da. Um, and I think completely apart from that, there is a play here. Mm. I mean, the, <laughs> the structure is actually quite recognizable. Um, uh, when you have a play that begins where a comedy ends with a wedding or an engagement, you know you've got problems coming up. You know, uh, women beware women. I have just run off with this beautiful young woman. That's where a comedy ends. That's where a tragedy begins. Or yeah, even yeah. something like Edward the Second, where my my friend Gaveston is coming home. I'm so happy. Like, oh dear. It's all downhill from here. Uh, so, so a play that ends where a comedy begins is a tragedy or most optimistically a romance. Things may work out in the end. So that's actually what we've got. We start it with a wedding. Oh, it's so exciting. You can only go downhill from there. Um, and then you have the parallel plot of the, the poet buddies, the, the, brute, the dude bro poets. So, I mean, I think it, the possibility exists that those two plays, those two parallel, those two threads could get interwoven. The poets get caught up in the the, the erotic intrigue in a, in a convincing and, and structurally clever way, but it all works out in the end. I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a play here. So I'm very curious to see if they pull it off, if they make a play and not just basically kind of a satire, hung on a very rickety frame of a play yeah because we've only had three scenes we've had an establishment scene uh, uh for two sets of characters and a complication um and that's all we've actually had and if you as i say strip out an awful lot of the the more self-indulgent material and maybe uh, make a few trims for clarity um you know this isn't potentially a very long bit of stage time that we've covered today um you know in, in its uh it bored down the question is where it's going and what it's doing and and, and w what we want to do with that is 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 what i'm sure we'll engage as we go forward any additional final thoughts because we still have we still have a bit more time uh, i've gone around the room but we can go around again uh, anyone want, uh, want to additionally throw in or clarify or or, or discuss uh alan yeah, I mean, I was just thinking on the, the sort of the history play potential. I mean, William Rufus, who turns up here, we've got Fair M, I think we did previously, that we allegedly references William the Bastard. Sorry, William I. Um, but with no real resonance to the rest of the plot. What was this just a trope? Let's see how many kings we kings of england we can actually get into the play scripts yeah it, it is uh, yeah it's it's one we, i think we have talked about the difference between a history play and a play set in the past um oh, or, you oh. know or set in history uh, as opposed to something that is actually engaged in history i don't think this is engaged in history i don't think it's interested in history but it has a setting which gives you an aesthetic and maybe thematically uh, the king will be important. Maybe not. Who knows? But yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah, it's uh, about as historically accurate as Fair M. Um... <laughs> uh, anything, any more for any more? Okay, right. Well, we have two more sessions to continue unpacking this script. All that remains, thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much and goodbye. Art thou there, goat's pizzle? <laughs>